Pollock here with Open Spaces Women. Today, we're talking about the birth strategy and how we are still continuing to do projects and making things profitable given the current market. Not just us, but us and our students, we're all doing the same thing. So I want to share with you all of the different tweaks that we're making to the strategy so it fits the current market. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'll be here for about 20 to 30 minutes. If you're here live, let me know who you are and where you're from. If you're watching a replay, drop hashtag replay in comments. A few things that I'm going to be covering today are what is BUR and does it still work? I get this question a lot. Hey, does the BUR strategy still work? Um, second, how do we find our deals given the market? How are we finding our deals? By the way, you guys, if you can just let me know if you can hear and um, see me, I would appreciate that. Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and see me in comments. I would love to know if everything is going well. Um, all right. So, um, yes, how are we finding deals in this hot market? How are we handling the increasing construction costs? That's another thing. Uh, Anika says, yes, over on Instagram and uh, on Facebook also, I got a confirmation from Angela um, and a couple more people that they can see and hear me, um, hear and see me. What did I say? Hear me and see me. Um, all right, thank you guys. So the second piece I'm gonna cover is how we're handling um, the increasing construction costs in this market. And then the third thing I'm going to cover is, are our tenants still paying rent? And what, our, what is our strategy in case there's a market downturn and people start losing jobs? And, you know, there, there's, there could always be an issue with that. And I'm going to uh, share with you my experience on what happened when COVID first hit and how we navigated that. Um, and, you know, what if they stop paying rent? We're going to talk about that. Uh, the next thing we're going to cover is the refinance piece. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we're handling the rising interest rates. And I know that's like a burning question that a lot of you have. So I'm going to cover that as well. And then any questions you might have, just continue dropping them in the chat. And I will try to get to as many of them as possible. All right. So let me know who you are and where you're from. Um, I'd love to. I, I'd love to know who all are here. And if any of our members are here, just let me know. Um, anybody who's in our program or who graduated or who is in our higher tier program mastery, just let me know if you're here. Um, all right, cool. So let me start first with um, what is BAR? I'm just going to take like a couple of minutes and go over it. I know a lot of you already probably know uh, what BAR is and um uh, somebody is from my cohort and to see the name, I have to go in the Facebook group. So I'm, I'm I just want to know who it is because somebody is saying I'm, I'm, uh, I graduated in March, 2021. So I got to know who that is. Yes. Amanda is here. Amanda and Brandon, um, they graduated. I'm so glad to see you guys. Um, I know that um, Aheli and Amanda and Brandon, you guys are, um, you're doing so amazing with your projects. Um, so proud of you. And um, actually, Aheli, um, if you haven't already, I would love to invite you to do a sensei session inside our program. And I know that Brandon and Amanda are going to do that shortly. So excited for that. So if you don't know this, we have these sensei sessions where, you know, as people are going through uh, the birth strategy as they do their first project, we kind of bring them in and every week, every other week, um, Within our program, we interview them and we kind of talk about all of the challenges that they were they faced going through the strategy and how they um, how they went through and how they navigated them and how they succeeded. And I I love um, I I think that a lot of us don't share 
share enough about the challenges and how we got through them. Everybody wants to talk about like how successful they are. So we just, we're always super open about it. This is business. It's a game of snakes and ladders. Sometimes we step on snakes. Sometimes we step on ladders. It's important to talk about all of this and have a community that supports us as we move forward. So that's the purpose of these sensei sessions that we do. That's inside our program. Uh, but all right, so let's start. So what is BURP? So super quick, I know most of you know this already, but for anybody who doesn't know what this strategy is, this is a strategy that has been done for decades. This is nothing new here, but it got this really cool name uh, from, I think, Brandon Turner. Somebody gave it a really cool name, and now everybody talks about it using this name, and it's become like a buzz acronym these days. And even though it's an, a new buzzword, I want you guys to know, like, this has been done for decades before any of us started investing in real estate. So this is nothing new. Um, don't think of this as something that's like really cool that just popped up. This is a very, very solid old strategy. What we do, however, is we take the strategy and then we supercharge it with many different things that we do. And that's a, a live for a different day. Uh, but uh, what you basically do is you buy a property that is distressed and then you renovate it. And then when you do that, you force it to appreciate. And once it, forced, once it has that forced appreciation, you receive forced equity and when you have that forced equity you can then rent it out get refinanced pull all of the money that you originally put into the strategy out and move it to the next deal and the next deal and the next deal and the next deal so that's basically how you take a finite amount of money and then you move it from one property to another and you create these cash flowing assets as you go along and you recycle the same money while creating this asset base for yourself. And so using this strategy, we've created a $10 million portfolio in the last five years. Both Niti and I, my husband and I are retired uh, based on you know, working just on this strategy, um, but also supercharging it so we can scale faster than a lot of investors have done in the past. And a lot of our students have done that too. We just found out like last month, I think five people hit their million dollar portfolio. So um, this is totally doable and it has been done for decades. All right. So the question is, does it still work in this market? And the short answer is yes. This strategy still works in this market. Um, and the reason I have been talking about um, this strategy and why this has been done for decades is because I want you guys to know it's not that the market changes and the strategy simply doesn't work. It's not like that because this strategy is not new. It has been done for decades, right? It's not like this shiny thing that just came up and everybody's into it. Investors have been doing it before I was even born and I'm not young, right? Like this has been, <laughs> this has been done for a while. So this is nothing new. It, this strategy has seen many ups and downs in the market side and a lot of different market cycles, and it still works. And I'm going to tell you um, why it still works. So what I see and, you know, my first property I bought right before the bubble burst in 2009. I bought it right before that. So we've, you know, I've seen it um, at, at that time. I was not planning to become an investor. I you know, had not caught this bug, but I had bought it. I was single, I bought a, uh, a property and it went through the ups and downs of the market cycle and it came back up and I recently sold it. And during this entire cycle, um, it was cash flowing. Um, it We made over a hundred grand uh, over the past, what, 12 years on this property in just cash flow. Um, we had appreciation and I sold it and I made, um, I think over 40 K when I sold it, even though the property lost 50% of its value within a couple of years of me purchasing it. So 
what I want to tell you is it's not just the bar strategy. As long as you are a long-term buy and hold investor, as long as you're in it, not for like short-term gains, like you don't want to flip a property and get out of it within six months or something, as long as you're in it for long-term gains, no matter what the market cycle, you can continue to hold on to your properties. And this strategy is extremely forgiving and you can come back and again, refinance it after a few years in case something goes wrong. Um, but what I have seen in you know starting uh, to invest since 2009, which I wasn't even thinking about investing at that time, but I had bought a property, um, all the way up to here is what I'm seeing is every time the property values start going up, the interest rates go down. And every time you see that the interest rates go up, they rise, the property value starts stabilizing. And what this does is either or you have one benefit in doing this strategy in whichever part of the cycle that you are in. So when the property values are high because the interest rates are low, lending becomes super easy. And when the interest rates become high, the property values start going down a bit and now you can scoop up a lot of really good deals. By the way, I just noticed like you guys have to see my nails. I hate going and like sitting in nail salons, salons and getting my nail like so fidgety. I hate doing that. The time we did this was my daughter and I went together and she 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 wanted like a a day out with mom, just me and her doing all kinds of girly things. And so we went and got our nails done. And since then, I've been walking around like this. So, so apologies. Um, but um, second question is, how to find deals in this hot market? A lot of a lot of people ask me, how, how, how are you still finding deals? Are you still finding deals? And sometimes I'll post some numbers and people are like, um, where the heck do you find a duplex for whatever, $80,000? Like, where are you finding this stuff? So number one, I want to tell you that the reason our acquisition costs are so low as all of our grads know it's because we're buying distressed properties if you bought a renovated property like that you would obviously not pay that amount so think about that before you you know start thinking like how are these people finding these deals it's they are distressed properties that is the name of the game with this strategy um second if you're um uh, actively investing in this strategy, or if you're thinking of getting start started, remember that real estate investing is all about relationships. You want to make sure that you cultivate long-term relationships with realtors, with wholesalers, and with various different parties that are in your community where you're investing so that when a deal comes, they know that you're a legitimate investor. And we do a lot of um, coaching on how to be that investor that's reliable, that builds those long-term connection. So, so make sure that when you come into this industry, it's not for that short-term gain. It's not for like just doing that one deal and getting that money out and moving on care about your reputation and you need to care about what you're bringing to the table when it comes to the other people that are involved in the transaction, right? Because no one really makes money until you close. So when you're in, a, when you're a part of a deal, if everything works, getting cold feet and backing out, that's not an option last minute. You want to make sure that if you are connecting with people and taking up their time and going through the process with them, you do close. And that's the reputation that you establish once you become an investor. And once you close on that deal and you have that reputation, then people are going to start bringing you deals because they know that you, you mean business and you're not here to waste anybody's time. So build those long-term connections. A lot of our deals come from people that we have connected with bringing us deals, right? And then we'll be doing projects sometimes on a street and everybody sees that we actually care about the neighborhood. We're going to clean out the street. We keep clean out the back alleys. We do a nice job with renovation. Um, and, and then when there is a neighbor that has a property for sale, they reach out to us because they know that we, you know, we're, we're going to care about the neighborhood. So 
the way you come across in this industry matters a lot in terms of how people bring deals to you. That said, if you're a new investor, that doesn't mean that it's not going to be possible for you to get started. There are so many deals I see pop up on the MLS all the time, just literally on the on the MLS. You have your Zillow app. Make sure that um, your Zillow, Redfin, whatever app you're using, make sure that you have your um, notifications turned on for whatever area you're investing in for your property avatar. By the way, if you don't know what a property avatar is, DM me and um, somebody will send you. Well, DM me if you're on Instagram and if you're on Facebook, just comment under this um, live, wherever you're watching this and um, somebody from my team will send you our ebook on um, getting started. And we talk a lot about uh, what a property avatar is in there. So once you know what your property avatar is, the specs of your property that you're after, and once you know where you're investing, have your notifications turned on on whatever app you like. And when you see a deal, the, the, the thing that you have to remember is if you see a good deal, this is not the time to play around with, with whether you want to do it or not. If you know how to do your numbers well, if you know how the strategy works, if you have somebody guiding you, you need to jump on that deal right away. Make sure that you're doing your numbers well. Please don't jump into a deal be, before you really understand how this works because um, it's very easy to lose 10, 15K if you don't understand this process well. So as long as you understand it, I still see, see deals on the MLS. You just have to get them right away. All right. The third piece is um, rehab. Oh, oh, I do want to add here. Uh, people ask me all the time, like, do we uh, do wholesaling? And so I'm a very specific kind of investor. I came from a place where I was making good money. I was making over six figures. I came into real estate investing because I needed time. I wanted time. So the way we approach real estate investing is very different than a lot of real estate investors out there. We were all about building a solid business with robust systems and processes. That's how we always were when we built our business. And that's how I have scaled really fast. And I applied a lot of business coaching principles and principles from my engineering background into real estate investing. And so we run our business very differently than a lot of investors. And so if you're somebody who makes a decent income and you want to retire early, then the way I run this business is right for you. It's not going to be right for somebody who doesn't have any money. There, there are different strategies that would work better for you than the way we do this. So if you're somebody who has a professional job or you, you run a business um, and you have a little bit of money and you want to come into real estate investing and you want to grow your portfolio fast, then what I'm saying is going to be more impactful for you. And then what I'm going to say is going to be more useful for you. It's a very small sub subset of real estate investors that do make decent money and they do have some money saved up, but they are doing this because they want to invest their money well, maybe retire early or make work optional and have more time. So if that's you, then this is going to apply to you, uh, which is that we don't wholesale. We, um, I don't want to get involved in real estate investing from a transactional perspective, because when you are a wholesaler or you flip properties, you are peddling real estate. When you invest for long-term gains, that's when you build assets. That's when you're building wealth for your family. And that's what we're all about. All right. So um, the next question is, how are we handling the increasing construction costs? So we have heard this a lot it come up a lot like, hey, the construction costs, especially after COVID, uh, there were a lot of supply chain issues and construction costs really went up. And people ask me all the time, like, how are we handling increasing construction costs? So the way um, I teach you how to do your deals is I'm always going to ask you to put a 15% contingency in your construction budget. And that's what everybody who works with us, we always tell them, 
like, hey, you need to have a buffer in your construction budget so that when things go up and down, whenever there is a surprise, you have some room to play with, especially as a new investor. So that allowed us having that little buffer allowed us to ride the wave when the construction costs went up. Things are settling back down now, I've noticed. So keep that in mind. Like whenever there's a little bit of um, ups and downs when it comes to construction numbers, as long as you have some buffer, you're good. You're good. Um, all right. Next question is, are tenants still paying rent? And what if they stop paying rent? Have you have you ever have you ever thought about that? What about if tenants stop paying rent? Um, Shuba over on Facebook is asking, what's wholesale? So wholesaling is when um, you sell properties. Wholesaling is an unregulated industry right now. Um, so not a, maybe somebody who hasn't invested before doesn't know about it. Basically, wholesalers usually connect homeowners to sellers without putting the properties on the market. That's what wholesaling is. Um, but again, it's an unregulated industry. Don't, you know, don't just go out and work with wholesalers without understanding how this works and without somebody helping you um, find good wholesalers. All right. So, yeah. So the question is, are tenants still paying rent? And what if they stop paying rent? Have you wondered about that? Can can you can you tell me if you're somebody who's wondered about rent or maybe um, you're someone who's wondered about landlording because somebody you know says that landlording is really difficult. Has anybody has anybody heard that from a family member? Like, why would you ever want to be a landlord? It's so hard. <laughs> um, all right. So. If you have, I know the comments are a little bit delayed, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, so if you have wonder about whether people are going to pay rent, okay, or whether uh, people um, did pay rent when COVID first hit, um, something that happened in our case was uh, when COVID first hit, um, about 90% of our tenants still continued to pay rent. We didn't have any issues, but um, we did have a very small percent of people who uh, who were not able to pay rent, right? Like we had, I think, two or three tenants. Um, yes, yeah, somebody's saying, um, yes, being la la a landlord is not easy. Um, yeah, so we did have some people who... Um, who lost job, their jobs, right? So I had two roommates in one of my units. Both of them lost their jobs. One was, was a waitress. When COVID first hit, the restaurants just shut down for a while. And so she lost her job. And the other one um, was a personal trainer. And she lost her job as soon as um, everything shut down, right? So um, everybody was social distancing at that time. And so both of them said that they were going to um, move in with their parents. They were young, two, two young people just um, trying to make it, right? They'd moved to the city. They were trying to make it. So they said, we're just going to move in with our parents. So what we had done was um, we had let them out of the lease early. That's what we had done. And then for one tenant, I believe what we did was we gave them one month off and we asked them if they wanted to put that rent at the back of their lease. And they did and they paid it and it worked out fine. So basically what we had done at that time is 90%, um, 90, 95% of our tenants continued to pay rent and people who didn't, we just worked with them uh, because they were good tenants, right? A good tenant is going to come to you and they're going to say to you that, listen, I lost my job and I'm going through a rough time. Um, should I move out? Can you let me out of your lease early? Um, can we, can you help me out this month or something? That's a good sign of a good tenant when they're actually in a hardship and they want to work with you. Um, a, a tenant that's not a good tenant, they're just going to stop paying rent. They're going to not communicate with you and they're going to continue living there. And so I, I really think that focus on if you have good tenants, um, 
understand what a good tenant means and then take care of them. Right. So, so we didn't have, um, we didn't have that many issues. And the reason we didn't have that many issues is because our screening process is very, very strict. And that's what I always teach people is like having a good tenant is an ongoing thing, right? But it all starts in the beginning in how you screen your tenants. So you need to screen your tenants really, really well to be have, able to have a good landlording experience 99% of the time. Uh, but one other thing that I always recommend to people is if you're concerned about a market downturn, um, I highly recommend Section 8. Section 8 is amazing. You are helping somebody in need. Um, you know, these are low-income people and, uh, you know, you sc still screen them well and become a part of the affordable uh, housing crisis solution, right? So we are really big on Section 8. Uh, we want to be a part of the solution. Two-thirds of landlords still don't accept Section 8 vouchers. And we want to be a part of the solution. We want to make sure that we provide good quality housing and uh, great customer service to our Section 8 tenants as well. So that's an option for you. Then, uh, you know, majority of your rent is set and then you don't have to worry about any ups and downs. So that's an idea. All right. The last piece is how are we handling the rising interest rates? So somebody was asking this question on Instagram and the question is, how are you handling rising interest rates? So as I was telling you before, I have noticed as things go up and down, when the um, interest rates start rising, you're going to see that the property values start stabilizing and that's great. So make sure that you keep that in mind instead of just taking that interest rate into account as you move forward. All right, so interest rates may rise, but um, the property values are going to come back to a stabilized amount and then you'll be able to do even more deals. Um, one thing I would recommend is if you're, if you're concerned, if you're caught mid burr and the interest rates start rising, which is what happened to us. We had a six, I think it was six unit um, portfolio that we were trying to refinance and the interest rates went up like that. You, you guys all know, right? That's, that's what happened very recently. You're mid refi and the interest rates go up. And this isn't like, con we don't do conventional loans. We're a business, we do commercial loans and that's what we teach. And so when you get caught during the refinance process and the interest rates have gotten to a point where, um, the refinance doesn't work that well, you can always work with your lenders to get that done. And so what we did was we called a whole bunch of lenders that we had um, in our Rolodex, so to speak, and we worked with them and we were able to, and we were able to, sorry, my mom called and the Instagram live stopped for a second. And so we were able to get the property, um, uh, the, the, the portfolio refinance. So yeah, you, Always be willing to call a whole bunch of lenders, have these long-term relationships set up with your lenders. And we were able to find a lender that was willing to get us closer to the rate that we were at before with a little bit tweaking of terms. We didn't get the exact terms that we were after. We were getting 30-year fixed commercial loan at a very low interest rate before. Now we are getting... Um, the same in similar interest rate, but it's not a 30 year fix. So it's still very similar to where we were before. Be willing to be flexible, work with lenders. And as long as you have this reputation and connections, you're able to navigate through these things. Um, all right. So um, question, any questions that you guys have? I'm here for a few more minutes. I can answer. Um, somebody is, Raj is asking from California, can Burr be done as an out-of-state investor? Yes, 100%. It's funny you, that you say you are in California. About 30% of the people in our program actually are based either in New York or in California, and they're all investing out-of-state. 100% possible to do this out-of-state. Absolutely. And the way we teach real estate investing, it is as if you are an out-of-state investor, even when you're local. Because 
this is, you know, the whole strategy and the whole execution piece that we have designed for the strategy is specifically meant for somebody who's super busy and who really doesn't want to create another nine to five for themselves. So yeah, so that's, it's totally possible and, and, and it's doable and people are doing it. Um, Victoria actually, um, she's based in California and she is investing in, um, on the East coast somewhere. And she just pulled out, I believe Victoria pulled out 12,000 more than what she put into her deal. So Victoria has crossed a million dollars in her portfolio, but she pulled out more money than she put in, uh, while investing out of state. So this is totally possible. You can do it. You just have to, um, really work hard in understanding how this works. Um, all right, so let's see. The next question, here we go. Do you have property managers for all your units? Yeah, so for the longest time, we had property management in-house. We currently do have a property manager, but even when I had property management in-house, I used a lot of systems and processes for property management, and I had a team as we started growing. Um so that you don't end up taking those late night tenant phone calls of the toilet being clogged and whatnot, right? You don't, you don't want to end up doing that and create another, as I said, nine to five for yourself. So um, yeah, even when we did have property management in-house, we had it in-house until very recently. Um, you want to establish a lot of automations, systems and processes and have a good solid team in place so that your tenants are happy, you're not spending all your time managing your properties and it's still profitable. So that's 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 how you need to take a look at it. Um, all right, so that's about it. Any other questions before I take off? Um, and while you guys put your questions in, I just want to tell you, we have an amazing program with a very high success rate. You can go to um, Instagram and DM me or you can go to Instagram and look at the... Uh, link in my bio to book a call with me, um, my, with my team to see if you're a good fit for the program. It's a three month program um, with a lot of focus on systems, processes, teams, investing in real estate and scaling your portfolio fast, starting with 25K. I need you to have $25,000 before you start investing because I think that investing in real estate when you have no savings, it's very risky. Please don't invest until you have at least some money saved. Um, you need at least $25,000 to invest in your property. You can DM uh, me over on Instagram or on Facebook. Just comment under this live and somebody will reach out to you and give you more information on the program. Um, we work with only a handful of people at a time. So um, we're very selective about who we bring in to, to the group. And it's an amazing group. Like if you talk to any of our grads, they will tell you it's a pretty incredible group of people. Uh, so come and join us when you're ready. Um, all you have to do is, um, yeah. Oh, somebody, somebody saying something on the... Oh, Vanessa, Vanessa, Vanessa is in our program right now. She just got her first deal under contract. She's saying, if you're looking to be your own boss and control your own destiny and have an interest in real estate, this program is perfect for you. There she is. I just put her comment right below my, what I'm saying here. <laughs> Vanessa, we love you. You know that um, Vanessa is currently negotiating her budget with her contractor. This is it's an amazing group of people. They're just like so generous and so different than anything else you'll ever see in real estate. So come, come, come join us. Um, all right, you guys, I'm going to take off any other questions. I'll take a moment to see if there's anything else before I take off. Thank you, Vanessa. I appreciate your comment. Oh, Linda is asking, what's a property avatar? Linda, um, I'm going to have, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this in Facebook, but I'm going to, I'm going to drop a link right underneath your comment for you to be able to download the ebook. Um, and anybody on Instagram, if you want to figure out what your property avatar is, just DM me and, um, and we'll get it to you. All right, you guys. So I'll see you on the next live. Uh, look out for my email. 
um, whenever we're going live next or watch any of our social media channels and we will post about the next live that's coming up. All right, it was so good to connect with all of you and I'll talk to you next time. Bye everyone.